There we go. Perfect. So as Connie said, I'm a psychotherapist and Canadian certified counselor through the Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association. Um, and one of the things that I, I first like to, to tell people when they disclose that they are neurodiverse, they have an invisible disability, is welcome to the world of the uniquely gifted. I'm a national award-winning entrepreneur, startup icon, an expert on disability-related startup companies. I am a speaker. Um, it's a picture of me taken with Temple Grandin at a conference a few years ago. Uh, for any of you who have not seen her movie, I highly recommend you watch it. Um, at one time, she was believed to be the most highly educated person on the autism spectrum. We know that not to be true now. But if anybody has eaten a hamburger in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, there's a good chance that she had a hand in it. She revolutionized the cattle industry and how cow, cows are slaughtered around the world. Um, so I highly recommend you check out her movie. And I was fortunate enough to be able to interview her for a podcast that I did. Um, and a, a fantastic, uh, incredible resource. I'm also a mentor. I mentor a lot of different entrepreneurs and startups. I'm an innovator. This is uh, one of the many projects that I'm working on. Uh, this is a community arcade where half the proceeds that go into it will go to fund programs where people can't afford them. I'm a contributor for an organization called Different Brains. This is another wonderful resource that I highly recommend you check out. Um, the founder is Dr. Hacky Reitman, and he has basically created a wonderful network uh, or community of neurodiverse individuals and information um, and acts as a resource for the neurodiverse community. I'm a contributor for the Mighty. Uh, if nobody's heard of it, you should definitely check them out. They're a great mental health and disability resource. And I'm also a chef and chocolatier. I have many different hobbies, but this is one of them. I know it's lunchtime where you are, so I don't know if I should leave this one up a little bit longer or not, but these are some of my interests and passions. And all these things are great, but what I really want to talk to you about is my journey and how I got there. And so I was diagnosed with ADHD and attentive type at the age of 30. Prior to my diagnosis, when people ask what life was like, I, I really describe it as my version of hell. Um, this is my high, high school transcript. I like to show this to people as motivation. Um, it took me four years to finish three years of high school, 32 attempts during 18 credits required to graduate, including failing grade 10 math four times. So I was diagnosed at the age of 30, and when I started taking prescribed medication, it essentially took my thought process from dial-up to fiber op. And so these glasses actually represent uh, the lens from which I get to view the world. Um, I created this when I became part of the startup community. I joined an accelerator pro program, and one of the first exercises we did was, as entrepreneurs, we had to create our business at Lego. And what was fascinating for me as a neurodiverse individual, I just kind of sat back and I watched all these other entrepreneurs create these massive projects out of Lego and really didn't need to be that, that intense. You know, we can kind of take a step back and look at things from a different angle and maybe they don't need to be as complex as we think they do. And so going from being diagnosed, taking prescribed medication and going back to upgrade as a mature student, I took five courses, uh, earned a new GPA of 3.7, and then 2010, I was accepted to the MED and Counseling Psych program, um, accepted on academic probation, graduated a year later at the top of my class. So I have a very unique understanding of my thought process and, and how my mind works uh, and being able to help other people kind of tap into their potential, explore their unique gifts, and figure out how do we take this even further. But part of that means understanding how you learn and understanding how I learn. And I like to tell people that I don't have the answers, I have perspectives to share. So a big part of my success in going from really stumbling through every every level of the public education system to rocking, you know, upgrading and my master's degree was really understanding how I learn and, and developing my own strategies around contextual learning. And so one of the things I like to tell people is that we need to start asking how kids can teach us or how our youth can teach us instead of assuming that we have all of this knowledge that we need to impart on them. And so understanding how I learn, I see in pictures. And so this is actually a, a friend of mine. His name's Gene Fowler. He's the, the founder of Lou Guru Animation and Games. Uh, he's worked on Family Guy, Caillou, even though I'm not a huge fan. Uh, Sesame Street and games for every platform you can imagine. And so when I meet with Gene, I'll ask him to drop my business plan so I have a visual 
uh, of what it is that I'm doing. Words don't mean as much to me. Um, because I'm a visual learner, I will tell people, I don't need you to tell me, I need you to show me. And so this is just another picture of that plan. And so for me, this is incredibly helpful. And so when we are working with different students, um, you know, there are some people who may be auditory learners, there may be others who are, are visual, but understanding how they learn and being able to create um, educational resources that will tap into everyone's type of learning style. And one of the big challenges is that, you know, in the concept of universal design, I like to use the example of the movie Elf. I'm sure most people have seen the movie Elf. Uh, when Buddy goes into the coffee shop and it says world's best cup of coffee and he comes out and he spits it out, right? Guess what? Not the world's best cup of coffee. Well, the same is true with universal design. Just because we call it something doesn't make it so. And so what universal design to me means really is a custom piece of material that's tailored to a specific individual. Yes, there may be certain people who have overlapping learning styles. You may be able to use a resource you've developed for more than one person. But the idea is to create these tools that you have in your toolbox, especially as educators, that you can use to work with different students. When I was doing my master's, um, you know, I, I had all these people around me telling me all the things that I couldn't do. And one of them was actually somebody who worked for the university in our, our, uh, our resource center. And uh, I met with her and the first thing she said was, don't expect to get the same grades as everybody else. And I just thought, why not? Why, why can't I why, why can't I get the same grades? Why can't I actually do better? So here we have all these people who are kind of settling it based on their own biases. And so rather than be defined by someone else's label, I choose to, to redefine that and make it mine, right? This, I think we need to look at things from, um, you know, we're not somebody who is less than, we can be way more than, but it's trying to change those self-limiting beliefs and we spend so much of our time trying to get people to fit into our world that we rarely explore how we can fit into theirs. And that's something that we really need to be mindful of and looking at. And, and one of the ways that I've been able to do that and working with a lot of my clients is identifying three, three certain ages. And so we have their physical age, their chronological age, which is the age that they are. And then we have their emotional age. For a lot of individuals who are neurodiverse, and I include myself in that, we are often much younger um, than our, our physical age. And so trying to find that that kind of sweet spot, and that is to be based on the um, age of people that they prefer to spend time with, along with their hobbies and interests, and sometimes how they react emotionally. And then there's the intellectual age, which is a little more challenging to try and determine. It is not necessarily the age at which someone um, academically um, is lined up with their peers. Uh, there's certain individuals that I've worked with where they may not be able to wipe themselves, but the things they could do on a computer would blow your mind, right? So trying to find that intellectual age can be a bit of a challenge and a balance. But where we need to try and reach people is their emotional age. And so I, I show this. This is a, a client that I worked with, um, very, very unique individual on the autism spectrum and brilliant. Um, I think he's 13 now. Um, and he'd actually been hospitalized, to, everything regressed uh, to infant-like behavior, and so slowly developing, coming back. And so he's artistic in many different mediums. And so in trying to work on his assets, because he wasn't in school, um, and trying to figure out, okay, why is he in school? How can I help get him back to school? But also helping him explore his interests, um, he expressed a desire to work with clay art. And so when I can identify someone's unique gift, I try to tap into someone in my network who can help assess their competency level. And so I paired this young man with uh, an acquaintance of mine who's a clay artist. And in their very first session, this is what he created. And so here's a young man who is barely in school and has this unique creative ability. This is a roadie that he made and he can sell these for 40 to $50 a piece. So for a lot of individuals I work with who are not in school, I try to figure out how can I help you do something more. And so for a lot of them, it may be starting a small business, learning financial literacy, but a big part of it is trying to identify what their unique gift is. We are modern day X-Men. This is one of the best ways for me to kind of use an analogy that most people will understand. When you think of the parallels between X-Men and what has happened with people with different disabilities, they're very similar. People are scared of what they don't understand. 
And so when it comes to people who are neurodiverse, one of the big challenges is that we look like everybody. But in order to make personal connection, the best way to do that is to have a conversation with someone. But for somebody who's neurodiverse, the more conversations they have can actually lead to more isolation because the more conversations they have, the more they realize that they have less in common with the people that they're trying to communicate with. And so this is a challenge, especially within families, um, because a lot of neurodiverse individuals are actually told what they can't do or told no most of the time. And so the people who should offer the most love and support often do the least because they're so focused on the things that we can't do that the things that we can do have just been skimmed over. But this is a huge industry. I mean, we're talking Forbes, Harvard Business Review. These major companies are, are looking at neurodiversity as a means of trying to expand the business world, trying to tap into these uniquely gifted individuals' assets rather than focus on perceived deficits to figure out how companies can actually increase their profit margins. SAP is another large company. Um, they have a um, autism at work program where they are recruiting uh, individuals on the spectrum to work at SAP. And a big part of what I do really is challenging people's perceptions around neurodiversity and, and ADHD. Um, you know, having ADHD doesn't make me a procrastinator. What that means is that I can do something in a very, very short period of time. I, I often used to joke if, if an employer, um, you know, was going to pay somebody for four weeks worth of work and I could do it in two hours, does that make me a procrastinator or does that make them a sucker? Well, I want to say it tends to make them a bit of a sucker, right? Part of the strategy is that you create false deadlines because we have a skewed perception of time. So by adding all of that extra time that really doesn't mean that much to us, we're just adding more time that will sit, worry, and wonder about the things that we should be doing. So creating false deadlines is one of the strategies that I use to help me stay on task. And so when we talk about gifts, for all the deficits that people have, we really have been focusing on those. And I use the analogy of the square peg in a round hole. Historically, society, the round hole, has tried to shift and tort and manipulate the square peg to fit through that hole. That peg is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that peg, but it's not gonna fit. And so I describe my work as expanding that hole. And so a lot of the work that I do is actually with parents. And the reason why is because if I don't work with the parents and help change their perception around their child, and uh, my work really is not to excuse behavior, but to help parents and educators understand the child's thought process. If I don't help parents and educators do that, and we send the kid back home or to the same school, then I'm doing a disservice to the client. So it really is about changing people's perspectives and opening their minds about what it means to be neurodiverse and how we focus on these unique gifts. And so different strategies that I use to stay organized as a neurodiverse individual, um, Apple products. So technology is, is a huge piece of how I stay organized. Um, I'm able to keep everything organized and synced across all my different devices, which is extremely helpful. I use Google Drive and Google Docs. Um, macro versus micro, that's one big thing. So people are neurodiverse, a lot of times we are macro big picture thinkers. And so one of the biggest challenges we have is the executive functioning piece of, we have this great idea, but how do we put all these little pieces together? How, how does it all make sense? And so we almost become paralyzed by the thought of doing something. And that's where the procrastination piece comes in. So how do we tackle something? Well, the easiest way to do that, to make sure that you stay on track is to make a to-do list. And this is a running to-do list. It can change all the time, but if, I don't write it down, it won't happen. And so this is one of the biggest ways that we can stay on task. I went through the wrong slides. That was the wrong slide deck, but that's all right. So, one of the things that I, I also wanted to share when we talk about neurodiverse individuals and, and how they learn and what their thought process is like uh, is in sharing part of my own story. In when I talk about high school and, and failing math as many times as I had, um, I lived in my own bubble, in my own thoughts and in my own head. And when we talk about individuals who are neurodiverse, for many of us, it's like we are the main character in our own movie. 
And so one of the challenges for neurotypical people is that when they talk to us, we may seem as though we understand. Because again, one of the challenges with having invisible disabilities is that in society today, when somebody says that they have something, our go-to is, well, prove it, show me. Well, for somebody with an invisible disability, what that means is actually reliving all of these different traumatic events that they've gone through that have led them to where they're at now, which is extremely hard, very hard to do. And so growing up the way that I did, I actually believed that I was dumb. You know, failing grade 10 math four times, when a student fails a class four times, that's not on the student, that's on the education system. And so one of the last pictures that, that came up after the thank you was actually a picture of me as a blackjack dealer. Um, I learned how to do mental math at the age of 24 as a blackjack dealer in Lake Tahoe. This wasn't a job I, I wanted. Um, before I was diagnosed and started taking medication, I couldn't remember simple basic instructions. If I stopped somewhere that was unfamiliar to get directions, um, I would try to remember steps one and two. If I tried to remember steps three and four, they'd all get jumbled in my head. I wouldn't play card games. I wouldn't play board games because I wouldn't be made to feel like a dummy. And so my coping strategy was just to avoid at all costs. And so before I was diagnosed and I had this job as a blackjack dealer, which I, I, I didn't want because I couldn't count, I didn't play card games. And all of a sudden they pushed me into this job because every year there are about 2,000 immigrants that will migrate to Lake Tahoe to account for their busy tour season that the locals don't want the jobs. And so as the English speaking Canuck, they pushed me into it. And I'm so grateful that they did because then I had something tactile to manipulate. So because I had poker chips that had the denominations on them and they taught me different tips and tricks on how to chunk up the money to, to count it, I was then able to do the mental math in my head. But before I couldn't do that, I couldn't even count change. I could be at a golf club, uh, any type of social event. And if I went to pay something, I would pull the money out of my pocket and I would go to count it. And it would be like, Someone turned off the lights and turned them back on and erased the process from my, from my memory to the point where I'd, I'd usually get so frustrated that I just put the money back in my pocket and walk away hungry or thirsty or cold. Um, and so here I am at the age of 24. How is it that a, a pit boss with no formal education in teaching can teach me how to count and do mental math, but none of the teachers or math tutors that I had growing up could, right? So then it brings in the part of the contextual learning. And, and how do we incorporate that into what we're doing? And so still being undiagnosed at the time, that was really my first inkling that I wasn't dumb. And so that actually helped me develop my mantra of, I may not learn in a conventional manner, but that doesn't mean I can't learn, only that you've not been able to reach me. And so context is key. And when I went to do my master's degree, um, I tried to figure out how can I use context of my interest into my education to help me do better. And so the first class I had in my master's degree was ethics, which is extremely dry, extremely boring. And we had a, a poster board project worth 50% of our grade. And so each group was given a, a section of our ethics guidelines to go over and, and create the poster board. And so my very first class, I was very nervous. As I mentioned, I just got in and I was on academic probation. Um, if I didn't get at least a B in all my classes, they were gonna kick me out. And so fortunate for me, I had a couple ladies in my group who were, who were open to my idea of using my passion of pop culture and movies to create a poster board for our project. And so rather than just talk about these different ethical dilemmas, uh, we use pop culture movies to show people how they would unfold. And so using my interest in my education helped me get an A+. Plus. And so whenever you can use your assets, your gifts, and incorporate them into your education, you're gonna be much more successful. For neurotypical, neurotypical individuals to understand what it's like to be a neurodiverse individual, many of us are empaths. And so we sense and feel the world more deeply than others. And so it, it can be a very lonely place because everybody looks like us, but not everybody thinks and feels like us. And so we are often pegged as being sensitive. Um, and, and I, challenge that is a negative connotation. I, I think that's an incredible skill and ability to have and one that I've used as an asset. And so one of my, my strongest gifts is my ability to read people. And I'll, <laughs> I laugh because I often will make people nervous. My gift is that within moments of observing or, or interacting with someone, 
I can tell how authentic and genuine they are. And so for me, being in a large crowd makes it extremely difficult because I don't like to have big relationships or big conversations with big people. And so developing strategies for me to stay on task and to do things and to keep busy so that I don't have to have those conversations. But I realize over time that it's not me, I'm awesome. It must be them, right? And so the challenge is trying to find more neurodiverse individuals who can connect and have meaningful relationships than trying to appease and please everyone around us um, because we want so badly to, to be liked and to have friends and to have interactions and be supported by family, but it doesn't always work out that way. Connie, do we have any questions that have come in? We don't have any questions yet, um, except that someone would like to know if we can get the recording later, and the answer is yes. Sure. So one one question that did come up that I would like to address was the um, about employment and neurodiversity and employment. And I think one of the questions was about disclosing um, your disability. And again, I, I don't have answers. I have perspectives to share. I can tell you that in all of my experiences of, of self-identifying uh, and applying for jobs, I've not once gotten a job where I disclosed that I had a disability. Um, but I would also comment that, you know, there was another question that, that was similar but, but different around um, hiring practices or, or how can neurodiverse people get jobs um, within large companies. And I guess one of the things that I would say to that is I spent a long time applying for jobs and, and trying to get into different companies and, and with our government and wasn't successful. But within, I'm celebrating six years of having my own business now. And I, I joke that I've been able to do something that no other company has been able to do since 2012, which is keep me employed for longer than 18 consecutive months at a time. So rather than wait for somebody else to give you an opportunity, I would encourage people to go out and create your own. Use your assets to try and create something. But I don't have access to my email right now. Connie, are there other questions that you can? Sure. Um, I'm going to give you another one that's kind of related to the one you just answered, and that is um, dealing with imposter syndrome um, in general, sure. in work, in class, in college. Et sure. So a big part of that is the internal dialogue that we have. And, and so I really encourage people to think about what does your internal dialogue say? And the evolution of my in, internal dialogue has, has changed significantly. Um, there used to be, just be a lot of negative self-talk, which was reinforced by the environment that I was in. Um, and so it took a lot for me to kind of get out of that mindset of I can't do to I can do, and to me it comes. It, it kind of relates back to that the employment piece of rock what you do. You know, I, I think that when you focus on what you do, and when you focus on trying to be the best you can be at what it is you're doing, nothing else really matters. So rather than focus your time and energy worrying about what other people think, just focus on being the best you you can be, and and it will be undeniable. You, People will come to you, they will flock to you. Um, again, we spend so much of our time trying to fit into everybody else's world that we rarely explore how we can fit into theirs. So Sean, we have some people asking if they can unmute and just ask a question. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Awesome, okay, go right ahead. Hi, that was me, Marina. Hi, Sean. Um, Hello. This is, this is really important, very, very significant in everything we're trying to do in our department. So I'm really, I really appreciate you talking with us today. Um, my question is, and it was difficult to put it in writing, that's why I wanted to, to talk. When, when you work with students, and I have a specific example of my own past student in my mind, that they don't, um, Maybe they haven't even been diagnosed, but, but even a self-diagnosis is not there. It's not clear to, to, to make me help them. 
and I've seen that person fail, even though in, in, in settings where, you know, there are exams or, or, uh, con or conference presentations in front of a lot of people, and I could tell that that was not because of what that person knew. There wasn't a knowledge base gap there. And my struggle was, and of course I, I couldn't resolve it, is how to kindly support that person to um, come forth with whatever is happening in their in their life in order for us to support them in a meaningful way. I'm not sure if that makes sense as a question. It, without, it, you know, without, in a polite way that we don't want to make this, you know, it, it's a it's a delicate situation, right? How we tell, ask somebody, you know, are you diagnosed with something? It's not something you can actually ask. I think. You're 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 correct. It, it's very much like some, you know, I, I can call my baby ugly, but you can't call my baby ugly. It's it's very much that type of situation. So the the best thing to do, really, even without a, a diagnosis, is to tr just try and ask the person, how best can I support you? Is there is there something that that you're needing that I'm I'm that you're not getting, and is there a way that I can help you with that? I think that's that's the biggest thing is just to try and be there and offer support. Um, no, you you really can't say do you, do you have a diagnosis? Do you, but I mean, if they did, I'm guessing that hopefully they would be, um, you know, part of the accessibility. Um, Group that you have on campus, and and if they needed accommodations and all of those things, and there's a process for those to happen. Um, but really, it's just trying to be as supportive as you can for the person. Um, you know, some of the strategies that that I mentioned uh, can be used by anybody, and I and I do help all kinds of people develop different strategies of of staying on task and staying organized. Right? If you don't actually create a plan to make something happen then in essence, you're creating a plan not to make something happen. So if you have something that is coming up that is due, if you're not actively planning on how to make this happen, then it's just going to happen without you and you're going to slip behind. And then once that happens, people may feel, feel so overwhelmed that they can't get out from underneath where they're at that they stop trying altogether. And so it really is just best to try and be as supportive as you can, offer the resources that are available to you, to that person. And all you can do is offer. I mean, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? So I think the, the goal really is just to be as supportive as, as you can. Uh, Sean, can I just uh, continue this? That's, uh, yeah, I'm very currently and uh, also faculty member in the department. And I can also tell from my own experience that we are one of, uh, along with the undergrad students, also the, for, the, for the grad students, it's actually uh, one of the, my students that, uh, yeah, so the, no any sign before, and uh, so in the first year, that everything was great, and then the suddenly in the second year, there's the apparently, I'm not sure it's because of anxiety issue or because of some other the personal life issue, and then the, uh, yeah, even the, for my group members, and the other students want to offer help, but then the, yes, it's just a closed door to everyone. And then the, later on, that's uh, nothing that uh, progress. Uh, and then the, even though such as I uh, personally talk with him to see whether that you need any help or suggestions. Uh, it's, and it's, it's the UConn uh, neurodiversity lecture, and I keep my phone keeps taking disappearing the sound and and cutting off. I'm sorry. Some, some on the phone. Yeah. My name is Mary, but thank you. Okay, so I can just continue my. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Okay. please. Yeah. So the later on, as the students uh, definitely uh, get help from the campus. Okay, on campus we have this uh, a professional the office to to help him. But then my 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 question is that so the. Uh, when the student could not just uh, even though that uh, visibly we can see something going wrong, uh, something going on with his either learning progress or the life, and uh, we try to help, but student just uh, shut the door, and uh, then the later could not do any the 
yeah, the improvement. So in that case, what we as a faculty member, how how can we do do more things for this? Or we just say, okay, so you just uh, uh, the student by solely depend on the the the, the mental health uh, the office rather than the open open their word to the faculty member. Sure. Well, it, yeah. it's it's tricky, and all all you can do is try and provide that support now. One thing that, that may be happening is that, um, you know, just just because someone is trying to help doesn't mean that it's being presented in the way that the person is going to be able to then process and internalize and, and be able to accept. So, again, looking at their learning style and, and context, context of what their passion and interest is and then using that to be able to try and relate to them, that, that would be one way. Another challenge may be that, there's, there's something happening in their personal life and w within the education system, how, how far over can you, you go? I mean, if you start to ask people about their personal life, is that something, an area that you may actually be able to help with? Or are we just asking for the sake of asking because we're wondering, right? So it may be that there's an aspect of their personal life that is now impacting their educational life and they're just not in a place where they're able to take everything on. So, Sean, um, we have quite a few other questions from the registration. Um, so I just want to ask people to try to limit their questions to be as concise as possible, um, if you know possible. So we have a question in the chat from um, Alexandra Hain about procrastination. Um, they say, while I agree it is an incredible tool um, to get things done quickly and one I use all of the time, I struggle with the anxiety that comes from constantly putting myself into that position. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. So part of it, I mean, I, I would need to know a little bit more about specific details, but I tell you, for myself, I, I really, I like to tell people I'm, I'm very rarely late, but I am usually just on time. So I think a, a big part of it really is about understanding and accepting where you're at um, and, and giving yourself permission to be okay with it. Um, you know, I, I I may do something two hours before it's due, but that's part of my gift is that I rock things on a very short time period. I could have started that three weeks ago, but I, I would have just agonized over it for that much longer. So the anxiety piece really, it may be part of, um, you know, not knowing how to get started, um, you know, for me, one of the hacks that I use is, well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying when I'm typing and I'm, and I'm trying to write, my fingers can't actually keep up with my brain. And so one of the things that I do is I, I create videos and this is a hack that I'd love to share. Most people aren't aware of this, but, um, you can upload a video to YouTube and the, depending on the length of the video, uh, within about a half hour, it will have transcribed everything that you said. So for people who are more, um, who are her auditory, you know, who are, who are talkers who do better orally than they may do in, in written form. That's a hack that it may seem more natural and easier to do and uh, may have less anxiety around trying to tackle something. But a big part of it, I think, is is kind of breaking it down, chunking it up in order to get started and, and trying to create manageable clusters of work that you can do that build one on top of the other. Awesome. Go right ahead. Um, I have a question. So um, I'm an undergraduate student and I struggle a lot with um, not being able to like learn information that I'm not really interested in. And I know that you um, mentioned like trying to tie in something that you are interested in into that. And my thing is like I, I can give you any information about animals, but when it comes to my history class, I like can't keep up. I have no idea what they're talking about and things like that. And I was wondering like what you recommend to like try to like stay on track in that like specific course where you can't tie in like your other knowledge? Well, I, actually, I, I think you can tie it in. I mean, I, I think that if you're looking at history, you can tie that over to what was happening in history of the world and, and animals and evolution at that time. Um, what were big discoveries that happened around that time that might kind of help you remember other things in terms of history and what was going on? So to try and bridge the two. Thank you. Awesome. We have a couple of more questions from the chat. Um, 
So how do you deal with people that feel so confident that only neurotypical people can succeed in certain fields like engineering? Well, that sounds like a false statement to start with. <laughs> um, Tem Temple Grandin, would, if anybody's seen any of her talks, um, you know, she would she would say that there are already a lot of neurodiverse individuals who are in the tech industry who just aren't diagnosed. And there's a, there's a lot of that. I mean, I, I work with uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, and when I was first getting involved in, in the startup community, I was hesitant to do that because I am my own product. Um, I don't have an app or a, a tangible product that you can touch or feel that I'm trying to, to sell. Um, I just had a total brain fart. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. No, go, I'll do that right now. Um, how do you deal with people that feel so confident that only neurotypical people can succeed in certain fields like engineering? Right. So. Uh, I think that again, it's 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 a myth. And where I'm going with my my story is that there, there are more entrepreneurs who are undiagnosed or diagnosed with ADHD than there are without. And so I believe that to be true. And in, in a lot of the engineering industries, there are a lot of individuals who are neurodiverse, but they've never been assessed and they don't have that diagnosis and they may not have that label, but they most certainly are. So I. I I don't think that it's so much of a, a confidence issue, and, and it comes back to, um, you know, my, my friend Gene Holmes, the Animation Studio, would say, I don't care if you went to Harvard, I don't care if you went to community college, I don't care if you funked out at grade one. If you can't produce, you will not work. So it's not about, you know, when we think about putting it, put, putting it in, in someone else's hands, you know, I wouldn't worry so much about neurotypical people, um, because as long as you make it about somebody else, it can't be about you. So thinking about other people in that way, I found to be a huge distraction. So take that energy, focus on yourself and try to be the best you that you can be in whatever it is that you're trying to do. And when you rock what you do and you're unmistakably the best, people will be knocking down your door trying to access you. You won't have to be trying to find a job. Awesome, thank you so much, Sean. So we have another question about um, ways to make meaningful connections with neurodiverse individuals. So they want to know how they can find more meaningful connections, like ways to find more meaningful connections. Um, do you mind if I like elaborate on that real quick? That would be awesome. Are you okay. a student? Yes, um, I'm a marketing major. I'm a sophomore. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you so much for all of this. I'm like almost crying. <laughs> um, and I also wish that my parents are here because like almost every single thing that you even just like mentioned on the fly is like huge topics that I feel like a lot of people with ADHD try to communicate, especially with family members. Um, and so I'm definitely going to be watching this again with them. Um, but my question was, so obviously this is like a little bit like the, there, there's a lot of personal factors and stuff like that to do with this, but in general, uh, and not to knock on UConn or anything, but I find that I can't find a lot of that kind of neurodiversity in, like, generally. And, and so, like, I remember spring semester when we were still on campus, I was like, all right, I'm going to take what I have. And I went to, like, every single club ever and tried to find people that, you know, clicked. With. And like you said, I can I know when I click with someone, like, almost instantly. And so I was doing that. But now that we're, you know, at home and I'm working remotely, I just kind of find it hard because the Internet has so many possibilities. And I don't know where to even start in terms of, like, finding communities um that are you know have people that I might have common interests with and especially with UConn's clubs and stuff now like some clubs are more like evolved in terms of how they're like dealing with with online stuff and then some of them aren't and so that trial and error process is going to be like a long time before I really find something and so that's why I'm just kind of asking, do you have any advice or, you know, more direct ways that can that, that doesn't involve so much, like, such a big thing to take on um, 
in the midst of like academics and stuff also uh that I can you know kind of keep working like just progressing in that in that in that direction because that's something that I've recognized is really important to kind of just keep my spirit alive and and stay creative and stuff like that so yeah that was long story short that was <laughs> yeah no that's 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 a great question and and you know it, it reminds me of you know when I work with a, a lot of parents and they'll say you know they they try to put their their neurodiverse child in this club or that club and and it you know they they can't find it 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 doesn't exist. And so my response to them is, why are you waiting for an opportunity? Why not create one? So if you're looking, you will keep looking. I mean, it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack. Will you ever find it? I don't know. But what I do know is that if you go and create your own opportunity, so maybe it's creating your own networking event, maybe it's starting your own club. Um, you know, it's the continual act of trying versus not trying, right? If you're trying to do something, eventually it'll happen. But if we stop trying, we become, become complacent, then we can't expect any type of progress to happen. So unfortunately, you know, one of the things you said, trial and error, that is one of the, the hardest parts of this because, you know, we, we have a conversation with someone, we, we hope that we're going to connect, but in most cases we don't. So it really is trying to change the internal dialogue. And for me, I try to teach, I, I, I try to think of each conversation as an opportunity for impact. Um, I, I would much rather spend less time with real friends than more time with fake ones. So I think it really is about trying to figure out who's on your team, um, find out who that small nucleus of people is, and then how do you put more time and energy into those relationships? Social media really has changed things. And I, I also give a talk on um, social media. And, and really, I mean, Facebook has redefined what it means to be a friend, right? Um, but they're not our friends. A friend is someone who, when you think of their name, the value they add to the relationship automatically pops into your head. If you think of someone and that doesn't automatically pop into your head, they're not a friend, they're an acquaintance, right? So when we reevaluate who our friends are and who's on our team and start to really hone in and focus on those relationships, I find those to be more meaningful than the act of trying repeatedly and, and failing. We will eventually find someone or some people, but it is, it is tricky because our interests you know, I, I guess another way to describe it is, you know, I've, I've had two different sets of parents who would, you know, they both have children who are neurodiverse on the autism spectrum and both have a huge fascination for Superman. The parents think, oh, it'll be great. We'll get the kids together. They'll have fun. No, that's like the worst thing you can do because one of them is really into Superman from this era and the other one is into Superman from that era and they will just bicker and fight about which one is better. So it, it isn't necessarily about trying to find other neurodiverse individuals. It's really about trying to have impactful conversations and relationships with other people. Now, there may be more uh, neurodiverse people who will gravitate towards you because they can sense and feel your energy. But rather than trying to continue to, to find someone or a community, I would encourage you to really think about how do you start your own. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. Thank you so much for your yeah, question, you're Rhea. Um, yeah. Samara or Samara would like to ask a question. Feel free to unmute yourself and go right ahead. Hi. So I have ADHD, but I wasn't diagnosed until like this year or a year ago because anxiety is my primary diagnosis. And I guess I was like good at masking ADHD. So I struggle with executive functioning, but I also have like a question about attention span. So I'm an English major and I take a lot of humanities classes, which means that I have like a lot of reading, but sometimes, and like, I can't really concentrate, including like on hobbies and things that I like, like whether it's like reading or watching TV, but like a lot of times when I'm reading something for school, my eyes track like several paragraphs of text and then my brain doesn't process it because like, my attention span is so short and I'm on a tangent. And then like I go back and I have no idea what I just read. And it's like this like this game of like figuring out whether or not I should like reread it or improvise to see if I can understand what I'm reading. So I'm just wondering sure. like 
how do I, as someone with ADHD, how do I mitigate that? So there are a, a couple of strategies that I can think of, but I, I first want to say that one one of the, I used to say that I couldn't read or that I didn't read. And now my confidence is at a, a place where I say, it's not me, I'm awesome. The publishing world just hasn't done a good enough job that creating a book that holds my attention. So it, it's not us, it's the publishing industry, right? So one of the hacks that I've developed is that when I'm reading a, a textbook, um, there's just, there's so much information. Tell me what I need to know. Don't tell me what you think I need to hear. There's just way too much fluff, right? So my hack is that I will go and read the summary. And if there's something in the summary that I don't understand, then I will go back and I will read that part of the text. That's, that's a big part. The other part is that it's okay for you to like to have all these interests and all these different things that you do. One of the things that I try to tell people is that when we give ourselves permission to cycle through all these different things, that's okay. We, we, actually, we can actually operate more efficiently that way when we have a whole bunch of things on the go. Um, the trick is to try and stay on task. So one of the things that I do is I'll set a timer. And so when that timer goes off, I'll shift gear. So I might work on a paper for uh, 15 minutes and then I'll switch gear and I'll go work on a, a different report or a different paper. And then I may have three or four things on the go all the time. Um, another strategy is audiobooks and, and trying to take it in that way. Cause we, we can kind of do this or we can do that. So if, if I'm reading, it's hard for me to take it in. But if someone is talking, um, it's much easier for me to take it in. Or if it comes in movie form, even better. Um, videos are, are kind of my go-to. I've been able to teach myself a lot of different things through videos, even the executive function piece. So when you're trying to learn how to do a new task, um, go and find it. Like, this is how I learned how to teach myself how to become a chocolatier, right? And, and the idea behind this, and this is one of the biggest things I hope people take away from this, the idea is not to succeed. I know that's backwards. The idea is to fail and to fail often, right? As a, a man, Growing up, I was taught that you never admit failure. That's that's a sign of weakness. And you don't want to show that you're weak. Well, no, that's actually an, an asset, right? I know that I rarely make the same mistake twice. So the more mistakes I make, the better I'm going to learn. So it, it's trying to take calculated risks, um, low risk, maximum reward to make sure that we're able to do what it is we want to do and, and to rock it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, Noah would like to ask a question. Please feel free to unmute sure. yourself and go right ahead. Hey, um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. You, uh, you especially, Sean. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm an undergraduate at UConn, and um, so I have, like, ADHD. I have, like, a reading and comprehension disorder. So, like, it really literally takes me, like, twice as long to read something as, you know, someone else. And I'm just finding that um now being i'm like utterly dependent on this online format and um i'm just finding that the amount of teaching support is 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 it's just not great and um you know for i don't know i'm just for example like i i, I try I'm, tr I'm trying to go to the zoom sessions for help but they're just flooded with like 50 people and so really it doesn't feel like i'm learning it just feels like it's almost like torture and um i'm like struggling because it's really hard for me to sit down for you know, an extended period of time and just watch Zoom lecture after Zoom lecture after Zoom lecture. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm teaching myself, but for classes as, and, you know, I guess it's, I could get by with, you know, for harder classes, it, it, like chemistry, for me, for chemistry, it's just like, I can't teach myself. And, you know, I just, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm utterly dependent on this online format and I just don't learn this way. Um, so I was just wondering, like, if you have any advice for, how to, I guess, navigate through these uncharted waters because, you know, I'm not trying to point the finger. It's just I'm feeling very discouraged, you know, and that's where I'm at. So thank you. Sure. So one one of the things that you said, Noah, like sitting there and going from a, a Zoom meeting. So is there a possibility for you not to sit there? Can, can you listen to the Zoom meeting while you're walking or on the treadmill or doing something? Like if you feel like you need to be physically active, then to go ahead and do that. Like I, I'm working from my office, but at my home office, I have a standing desk and I, I will rotate, I will move. Um, the other thing that I, I try to promote are fidgets. Um, you know, when you're in those types of, um, you know, sessions, so these are a couple of different fidgets that I have. One is a Rubik's cube, never been solved. I don't intend to solve it. But the idea is that busy the hands, free the mind. 
So when you keep your hands busy, it actually opens your mind up a little bit to be able to learn. But if there's something that they're going over that you're you're struggling with, then you know I have no shame in admitting this. I will do a Google search, explain whatever to me, like I'm five years old. I will go back and I will find ex basic basic explainer videos that will explain basic concepts to me in a way that I'll get. And then if I learn something from it, then I'll share it because there's a good chance that somebody else in my community will too. So it, it really is about, you know, rather than getting caught up in, in the not learning part, is trying to dissect what is it that I'm not learning here and how can I get it in a different format that's not that's not being shared with me. And then if you find that, to say, hey, to, to you know, your class, I found this video that explains this because I can guarantee you, you're not the only person going through this. You're the only person right here, right now, who's vulnerable enough to share it, right? So a lot of this stuff, you will, you know, in, in sharing it, you are essentially going to help someone else. Um, they don't know that they need it yet, but they likely do. Thank you so much. Yeah, I guess I just need to be like more of an advocate for it's just, you know, sometimes like the TAs will, or the professor will be going through it. They're like, yeah, yeah, this is super easy. But I'm like, wait, no, like, I, but then I don't want to ask, you know, like how to, if I don't get it, then I'm like, oh, you know, it's just, it, I don't know. I, I just need to, I guess, be a, more of an advocate. And um, I really appreciate your advice. Thank you. Truly. Thank you. No, no, no problem. And that's, that's really on, on the, the props, right? Like we really need to work on on how we communicate, and, and part of the challenge is again with having an invisible disability is that when when we look at someone, we assume that that they're going to process the information that we're relaying in the way that we that we do, and that's just, it. It's not the case, and it goes both ways. I mean, as neurodiverse individuals who are also uh, empaths, um, we feel a certain way, and we can't understand why the people who are closest to us can't understand what we're going through because to us it's as plain as plain can be. It's it's as real as real can be. So how is it that these other people who are so close to us can't understand what we're going through? Well, it's because they can't read our minds and we haven't communicated that to, to them. So in, in that same way, if you're not communicating with your prof on exactly what your needs are, and, and again, firstly, you've got to figure out how you learn best. What is it that you need? Because until we kind of figure those things out, Noah, it's going to be really hard for anybody to help you, right? It, it, it'd be asking them to do something that they really don't know how to do. So I would, you know, if you figure out how you learn best, then you can approach your, your profs to say, this is how I learn, or is the way that we can accommodate this so that I can thrive in this class. Um, yeah, that, those would be my suggestions to start. Can I quickly um, add on to his question, okay. kind of? Um, so he kind of mentioned like blame and like, it's not like necessarily my fault, but I, I wanna like explain how I'm feeling to my professors and things like that. Are there any like tips you have? Like, I'm blatantly honest. So I just like, I put it out there, but I feel like they take that as like, I'm not trying or I'm not giving it my all and those things like really hurt. Um, so I was wondering like how, like I like this talk, like actually like opened my eyes knowing that like I'm not alone with all this. So thank you for that. But I was wondering, like, is there any other advice like when writing an email or advocating for yourself, what tips do you have? Um, well, one of, one of the biggest ones is in, in my older age where I'm sure I've learned to reflect before I react. So if you're, if you're worked up, then maybe it's not the best time to be sending that email. Um, so if it's, you know, and I think too, tone is not conveyed in, in text or written format. So it is really hard for tone to get misconstrued in, in that type of communication. So if you are feeling a certain way, it might be better to try and set up a meeting with the prof. Um, during office hours to, to have a face-to-face -face conversation. And then you're also able to gauge the reaction, right? I mean, based on their body language, you'll be able to tell, you know, do, do they sincerely get what it is you're trying to convey um, or do they not? And if they don't, then try and explore what other avenues you are, are available. Um, but I, I think, you know, you kind of have to gauge the importance of what it is you're, you're trying to share. Um, if it's something, you know, that, that is that serious, I think I, I would much rather have a face-to-face -face meeting if, if I was able to get that than try to go back and forth through email. Excuse me. We are out of time. Uh, do you mind staying on? You've already stayed on about five extra minutes. Do you mind staying on a little further, um, or do we need to just, you know, wrap things up, Sean? I'm, I'm good to stay for as, as long as we need to. Awesome. Thank you. So um, does anyone else have any questions? I know that um, 
I saw a couple of questions in the chat about any broad suggestions for working on self-love rather than self-blame. Any suggestions for working on self-love rather than self-blame? <sighs> well, it's it's tricky. Again, it, it comes back to that internal dialogue, right? Of, of and, and a lot of that negative self-talk is re reinforced by the people we surround ourselves with. So a, a part of that is understanding, again, who, who are you surrounding yourself with? What are the messages that they're conveying to you? And are these messages that are reinforcing positive self-talk or negative self-talk? And if it's negative, then maybe reevaluate um, the relationships that you have and who you choose to spend time with. Um, you know, it, it again, when you think of those people, they should be people who typically want to prop you up instead of kick you out of the knees. So that that's that's a big part of it is you know finding people who accept you for who you are who love you for who you are and and then you in turn will start to change that internal dialogue another big part of this that i truly believe is is music um i believe that we all have our own internal playlists that we go through in good times bad and in between so i i really believe that if you're in kind of a, a negative space that you know if you have a playlist that of songs music that inspire you, that kind of pump you up and, and get you into a different mood. Um, that can be one way to kind of help rewire the dialogue that's happening in your head. Awesome, thank you. Um, it looks like Rhea has another question. Yes, okay. Um, this is, a, I, I just had a question about like resources and I, Fine. I'm like, you know, I, I am a bit of a nerd about like, you know, figuring every, like just reading about every single thing about ADHD and like learning as much as possible and like kind of trying to attack it like that. And what I find is there's a lot of, A, there's a lot of conflicting scientific research since it's such a new field. And so I was, I was just looking for more concrete stuff that you may know uh, that's not as, like, you know, um, popular. And then the second one is, um, like, self-help and, like, support and stuff. I find, like, like, for an example, like, the Attitude magazine, which a lot of people know about, that website, a lot of those websites have articles about, you know, like, when you first find out about ADHD and like, you know, the relief and like a lot of the things that like it, it recognizes like the things that you may be struggling with. But at, at a certain point, like I want constructive strategies and a lot of those articles, which are which are fewer, um, the articles that are like, you know, focusing more on what you can do as a solution are all very, like, I, in my opinion, are very directed towards neurotypicals. And I'm like, this this is advice that I've heard over years and years and years and years. So I'm like looking for, you know, a more targeted and like, especially like the skills and the hacks that you were mentioning today. Like, do you have any like reading sources, articles, videos, whatever, of more stuff like that, that that's a little more thoughtful and, and not just kind of like, you know, very generalized. I don't know if that made sense. It, it, it does. And uh, the answer is no, because I haven't written it yet. Ha ha. But when, when people tell me that, you know, they've read this or they've read that, I typically will just tell them to stop. Um, a lot of these books that have been written are their, their products. They're not actually meant to help. They're meant to sell a product help somebody make money. The difference between thinking and knowing is experience. We have too many people who think they know, but lack the personal experience to be credible experts. And so when people tell me about all these different books that they've read, I compare them to fad diets. And so when somebody reads a book on a fad diet and they try it and it doesn't work out, do they blame the author? No, they internalize that and they blame themselves. Now, if we look at it from a parenting perspective and a parent is reading uh, a book on how to parent a child with ADHD, and they, they read all these strategies, they try to implement them, and then they don't work. The person who really suffers for that is the kid through no fault of their own, right? So, again, mm -hmm. it, there aren't a lot of credible resources. And when I say, you know, we should blame the author, well, when you think of the, the fad diets, 
Um, you know, think of Atkins. Does anybody know what happened to Atkins? Everybody remember the Atkins diet? More protein, less of everything else. Um, he actually died of a heart attack, right? And th this this particular fat diet was even implemented in Subway. It was implemented in a lot of different restaurants, right? Because it's a fad that preys on people's insecurities. So magazines like Attitude Magazine are actually more geared for parents um, who are worried about mm -hmm. their children. And I, I really challenge a lot of resources that are, are, are out there. And I use the example of um, dyslexia. There are a lot of programs out there for people with dyslexia. But again, these are products that are packaged and meant to be sold that are based on people's insecurities, right? How mm -hmm. much time and energy do we spend on trying to teach these kids who have dyslexia how to read and how much pressure is put on them by their parents to try and make them become something that they're not? Mm -hmm. and, and how much dam how much damage does that do um, to their long term mental health? And and it is tremendous. So you know a lot of these things that are created are not actually helpful, and they are distracting. So the biggest thing really, if you're trying to figure out what is going to work best for you, instead of trying to to read about it, is try to do it. Okay, just. Okay, I, I, I totally understand that and I and I do that. And I think I also another motivation behind that question was also just finding um like solace and just sort of like having like a go to when I may not necessarily want to call my other friend who has ADHD or like other things that aren't as easy to just kind of like you know, like as a coping mechanism or something to just kind of go back to when I'm feeling lost and stuff like that. So that was kind of the motivation behind that. But I don't know if your answer would be very okay. different um, based on that because it's not an easy question. Slightly, but. slightly. slightly. I, I mean, my, I, I think one of the reasons why people who are neurodiverse tend to find more like-minded people online is because they're more accessible. And there are a lot of really interesting trailblazers in the, the neurodiversity community online. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like you, I, I make videos all the time. So I've got, I, like I have a YouTube channel, I've got videos on my Facebook page, uh, Different Brains is another one, um, but there, there are no shortage of uniquely gifted individuals who promote what they do through trial and error for us to learn from. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge is, you know, the idea isn't that you're going to see something that's going to work exactly for you. The idea is that you're going to see something and that's going to spark an idea that might work for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, I used to, I spent so much time trying to find a system that would work only to, to realize that there is no one system. Um, I have to take from different parts of different systems and create something that works for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, we still have questions left over from the registration, um, but I know we're very over time. So should we wrap things up, Connie? I, I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. So you were, you were talking about how you were, uh, you were going to teach parents how to do with kids with ACHD. Uh, would that also apply to siblings? Or um, it it should and and it it hasn't been something that I've experienced a lot. Um, I have more so for for um, siblings of individuals on the autism spectrum, uh, but really it it also depends. I mean, there's a high level of comorbidity with ADHD, which means that it's pretty rare for someone only to have ADHD. It's usually piggybacked with some other form of learning disability. Um, and so depending on mental health, some mental health issues, you know, there are some siblings who may have to miss out on certain things because their sibling requires a certain level of, of care or parenting, which prevents, um, you know, the whole family from participating in certain activities. Um, but it, un unfortunately, no, um, I haven't. When it comes to ADHD, I haven't um, worked with siblings as much. I've kind of relied on the parents to work with the sibling in the family. Uh, but if that was the case, I would definitely do that because it really is about enlightening and educating everybody in the entire family, not just the, the parents. But certainly from my perspective, that's where it starts and hopefully it would trickle downhill. 
Right. That's it. Thank, uh, thank you. For, thank. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Sean, and everyone. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks a lot for uh, for asking the questions, Noah. And and um, you know this will be available, and and I'll be doing other talks and workshops over the course of the project. So I look forward to seeing you some more and and hearing some more great questions. You'll definitely see me. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye bye. You're welcome. Take care. Okay, so it looks like we are wrapping it up, and thanks everyone who's still here for joining us, and we hope to see you um, at our next sessions, and please don't hesitate to contact us by email. Thanks a bunch. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.